a whole lot of football to get to this week. We're bringing in Seattle Times, Adam Jude, who covered the Huskies. For how long were you covering the Huskies? Six years. So Six years the, of the Huskies. Last year of uh, Sark's reign, and then so the first five of Chris Peterson. So, All yeah. right. And, then, uh, and, and now you're over with the Seahawks. Now we're over with the Seahawks. So uh, we, we're going to cover Huskies, Seahawks. I also want to talk to Adam about Mike Leach and Oof. all the controversy about that comment he made uh, after the Apple Cup, the fact that he took on a reporter and um, – and I don't want to get into that because you and I are probably we'll going to disagree there. there. We'll get but there. <laughs> if I go off right now, it's going to be a while. So uh, let's start with Chris Peterson. He's out after six years. You got to coach uh, the bowl game coming up. And then, um, you know, I noticed at his press conference that I felt like he was just like, I'm just going to get this over with so I can walk. Mic drop. I'm yeah. out. See yeah. you guys later. I don't Did ever you get talk that to you again. A little bit. Yeah, early on for sure. It felt like the weight of the world off his shoulders. You know, we know how, how much he – dislike sort of this aspect of the job right talking to us he's good at it but he just he he never enjoyed that aspect of it and I think that's a big reason why he stayed in Boise State for so long you know a smaller market he loved just being able to put his head down and do his thing he just wanted to coach football just wanted to uh you know his built for life program he didn't like all the hoopla he always said I, I'm not into the politics of it so you know a little bit bigger city here in Seattle obviously get a little more attention particularly gonna have some success so sitting in front of cameras and doing the press conference stuff he never really enjoyed it but I thought he was really articulate um, I thought he was really good today just talking about his reasons why you could tell he's thought about this for a while and in fact he revealed that this is something he's been thinking about really since after the Rose Bowl last year because as a guy who grew up on the West Coast loved football as a kid his dad was a small college coach in Northern California the Rose Bowl was everything at that time. You think about what the Rose Bowl has meant in the history of college football. And for a kid um, wanting to grow up and play in the Rose Bowl, no doubt, for him to be able to finally go to the Rose Bowl. Last year was his first year taking that Husky team, his first time he's ever been to the Rose Bowl. And he said, looking back on that a month or two later, he realized he didn't appreciate it. He didn't enjoy it like he thought he would or he should have. And to him, I think that was that was a big sign right there and really kind of started him down this path that maybe it was time to step away and do something different. It was just had a different vibe about it. So, yeah, going to the press conference today, you know, he was as loose as I think I've ever seen him in that kind of situation. And he really did get emotional at the end. He, he didn't talk about his family or his wife really at the beginning because, as he said, he knew he was going to get emotional. So it was at the very end where kind of bowed his head, was trying to catch his breath a little bit there, and you could tell he, he got choked up. He absolutely got choked up, got a little teary-eyed. So it was fun to see that human side of him because he doesn't reveal much about himself. He's a very private person, and we know he's like, he obviously is human, and he has emotions and has feelings, and that's really what led him to this decision because, you know, at 55 years old, um, not a common decision for a lot of guys – you know, having the success he's had in the college football career, making the money he's making. But for him to make that decision kind of tells you a lot about what he realizes is important to him uh, as he sort of takes this next step in his life and, uh, you know, his wife and two grown boys now, but wanting to spend time with them and wanting to figure out what else he can do with his life. When it came to the job itself, it was like, I'm out. But when it came to thanking his family and talking about how important his family is to him, that's when the tears came. So you can see where his priorities lie. Absolutely. And he's always talked about that, too, having balance and having perspective. This was a guy who, um, you know, he would uh, he would talk to his team about, you know, things going on in the world, politics, Brexit, I remember a few years ago. That was huge. He, he gave his team a whole tutorial. He had, um, you know, uh, Every Wednesday, even during the season, um, he had something called Real Life Wednesday. He would either do something himself. It could a number of talk, topics. It could be uh, he could bring in a financial speaker to talk about, you know, just getting that side of your life as you as you get older and organized because those are life skills that so much of so many of us didn't learn at a, at a young age so think about the value that adds you know as a student athlete at the University of Washington to have something like that uh, just from <laughs> I mean I've heard stories of him just talking about um, you know sex and talking about right and, and consent and how important that has become and uh, the Me Too movement he he's didn't shy away from anything and so yeah, I think he's a guy who's always had his priorities uh, pretty in order and I think for him when he started to realize it got out of whack and as he said the stress and the anxiety of of just being a head coach and being responsible for over a hundred <laughs> as, as he said um you know the dumbest group of people in america he was being blunt it's true we we're talking about 18 to 22 year old young men we were there um you know and have, imagine being responsible for that many that many kids that age and it's i was absolutely gonna wear on you and and when you're when you're talking about being in the spotlight and and just uh you know having the responsibility 
responsibility he does. At some point, obviously, you need to kind of figure out, you know, an exit plan and figure out where what what makes sense for you and your family and your life. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, we were all shocked Monday when it when it came down when it did, just a few days after the Apple Cup. But you know, if you kind of step back a little bit, I think it makes a lot of sense for Chris Peterson. And I think he has dropped hints over the years that that, that something like this was around the, on the horizon. You know, it was interesting to read into a little bit more because it feels like. It really feels like he could just be in advisory mode for for the rest of his life. Like he may not want to coach again. Yeah, and it's really interesting because I bumped into Jen Cohen walking walking out of the the building at UW today too, and and she said he's already bombarding her with ideas, and and you know he's he's got. I think a lot to offer to the athletic department and beyond football. And he articulated that I thought pretty well too, because again, we talk about his built for life program and I think it, it really did mean a lot to him. He's spent a lot of time over the years, uh, inventing that and reinventing it, updating it. Um, I was invited to sit in on one of those presentations a few years ago, a few, a handful of us were, were involved in that. And, you know, you go in with the reporters sort of skeptical eye on some of that stuff. It's my job. And, and, um, you know, no, no cynicism here about that. It was really impressive and it's really genuine. You can tell when somebody's trying to sell you something or they're being a little fake about it. You can tell that means a lot to him. And it's something that he obviously gives to all the parents that come through of recruits and to the recruits themselves. And he spent a ton of time. He spent years on that sort of thing. And it was a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation he gave to us. And that was just a, the, the introduction to the Built for Life program and what it is. And again, it's something where talking about the real life Wednesdays that he does, but it's an everyday thing, I think, for those guys there, even during the season. And I really don't think you find that uh, in too many places in college football. So your gut feeling when you when you I'm hearing you talk and I'm hearing the stuff that he has said in your gut, do you think he'll ever come back to coach? I kind of doubt it. Yeah. I mean, you never say never. I've already had a couple of NFL scouts reach out to me. Do you think you'd be interested in the Dallas Cowboys next year? And I think the only reason that question comes up is because Kellen Moore is obviously his quarterback at Boise State is, is the OC now with the Cowboys. And so there's a, a natural connection there. But I would be stunned, particularly in the NFL. Uh, he's never coached a day in his life in the NFL. He's just never been an NFL guy. Not to say he can't do it, but I just don't see it. Um, and again, you never say never. If maybe the right opportunity open up again, maybe Boise State a few years down the road. I mean, who knows? But to me, he's a guy who he's made his mark. He's content with with what he's done. He's had a ton of success, and, and now he's looking at next chapter. And as he said, he's still got a lot of energy. He's got a lot of. He feels like he can really still inspire people, inspire young men, young people. And I think he's got a nice platform at the University of Washington to do to do that right now. And or that, however you want to call it, advisory role, uh, sort of an assistant athletic director type role too I, I think they'll let him define that however he wants here going forward but he'll do something he's he's a, he is a great leader and um, I think he does have a lot to offer yeah oh, I love that line he said today he was quoting but he said a man has two lives to live and the second one begins when he realizes he only has one and I thought man those are the kind of things that he he kind of bases his life on and um, he's a deep thinker um, but I want to move on from him now, and, and let's talk about Jimmy Lake. Because yeah. you've, you've gotten to know Jimmy over the years. He certainly has been a, a staple in that program. Uh, what do you see from him? Yeah, he's a great recruiter, first of all. And when you talk about just energy and enthusiasm, um, competitiveness, he's got a twin brother. I remember I interviewed him uh, at length last year for a, for a profile going up to leading up to the Rose Bowl and some really fun anecdotes from his twin brother. Obviously, growing up, there were four boys growing up together, and you can imagine athletic family, how competitive that was. And uh, no matter what it was, whether it was swim meets, uh, whether it was baseball, basketball, football, Jimmy Lake starred in all of it. And then even in their WWE style living room <laughs> wrestling matches, you know, Jimmy had to win everything. He was one of the middle boys, the two twins. And if it, if it meant resorting to grabbing a chair and trying to, you know, threaten people with it, that's what he did. You know, this guy is determined to win at everything he does. Um, and again, you just look at what they've done with that secondary, all the NFL talent that, they, that they've produced. Buda Baker, and he made his announcement live here on King 5 coming out of Bellevue High School, you know, committed to UW. And that was because of Jimmy Lake, Chris Peterson and Jimmy Lake together. Um, went in on Bush, uh, Buda Baker, who was going to go to Oregon, if you remember, and they made Buda Baker their number one priority right away when they got the job six years ago this December. And lo and behold, uh, you know, in, in six short weeks, that they made uh, a huge influence on Buda. 
and that started this whole path, really. I've, I've called Buda Baker before the most important recruit Chris Peterson has ever had at the University of Washington, and that I absolutely believe that mm -hmm. remains true. I think you could make a case for Jake Browning and Miles Gaskin too, but Buda Baker really set the tone for that first recruiting class and then that whole defense. We think about how great this defense has been with Jimmy Lake and Pete Kwiatkowski and uh, how, how dominant they've been in the Apple Cup versus that air raid offense. And, and I think we heard Jimmy Lake say it, pretty directly today too that they're going to bring that same intensity um that same fire to the offense as well and I think he hinted at there might be some changes around the corner when you talk about those things too because I do feel like I've said this publicly as well uh Chris Peterson got a little conservative the last couple of years and for as much as people want to point the finger at Bush Hamden the offensive coordinator um this really was a Chris Peterson offense always has been I felt like always was going to be with him there and I I think he felt it too Chris Peterson I always felt like he got a little tight at times and even with Jake Browning as a veteran quarterback last year they were playing too often um, not to lose instead of playing loose, playing free to, to win. And I think we saw that again at times with, with Jacob Eason this year too. So I'm really curious to see. I don't have any great insights on that, but I, I think um, whether it's with Bush Hamden or somebody else calling the shots there, I, I think Jimmy Lake has let it be known that they're going to they're gonna pivot a little bit with what they're looking to do offensively and be a little more aggressive and air it out a little bit. Some guys don't make that transition from coordinator to head coach very smoothly, and they don't have that success. And Jimmy certainly is now on that seat where you wonder how he'll do as a head coach as they take him away from the defense a little bit. And he probably will have his hands on that defense somewhat. But what do you think? you think that uh, he can make that transition? Yeah, I mean, I think he's got everything in terms of experience, every bullet point on his resume that you'd want at this point, for sure. And, um, you know, he's he's charismatic. You know, like I said, he's great in the living room with recruits and their parents. You look at all the, um, you know, top guys he's been able to pull in year in and year out. And then once he gets them in the program, again, he's developing those guys. And uh, if we could just go through the list, Buda Baker, Kevin King, Sidney Jones, Taylor Rapp, all these defensive backs playing on Sundays now go on and on and on yeah. and then um it's it's been really special what they've been able to do and and again i just think when you when you have that intensity about you and you have that passion it it obviously reverberates down from from the head coach and chris peterson even said it you know he said he felt like the program is obviously in a good place it's not like you need to blow it up right now but he felt like it it does need a little bit of um you know just a, a recharge a little bit right now and i i think jimmy lake 42 years old he's at a perfect point in his career He's, this is something he's had his eye on for a while, whether here or elsewhere. But, you know, he, he was on the path to be a head coach, I think, for a while now. And I think it's the perfect timing. I don't think Jen Cohen needed to call anyone else. And I don't think she called anyone else. I think the first call was to Jimmy Lake. I think he said yes in a heartbeat. And, and here we go. You know, they're off and they're, and they're going. She called him right away, right? Did, didn't word get out Saturday and she called him like Saturday night? I mean, like it was like boom, boom. Pretty much. Yeah. And Peterson said, you know, I, I'm not quite sure <laughs> on the timeline this is what they said publicly but you know Peterson said he knew in his heart he had made up his mind two or three days before the Apple Cup and so you know they played on Friday and then Saturday afternoon Jen Cohen is calling Jimmy Lake so it happened pretty quickly there and <coughs> excuse me sorry Paul I, I think um, I was told from people close and around you dub that really only about six people knew over the weekend so it was a really tight circle there and for them to be able to, to keep that news in for a couple of days and announce it themselves on Monday in this day and age when, you know, breaking news and we, everyone's got sources, but that tells you how tight that circle is at UW and how tight, you know, Chris Peterson's circle is there too and the way they operate there. All right, let's move on to, the, to, to Mike Leach and the Cougs. Um, oh boy. He, he loses his seventh straight Apple Cup. There was some conversation afterward. Of course, when a coach comes in after a game, he needs a cool down period uh, before he starts talking to the press. I want you to listen to this comment again and his exchange with uh, the reporter from Spokane, and and then we're going to pick it up from there. Well, it's frustrating. I, I do find this part of it interesting, though. I mean, as fast as you guys rank their recruit, recruiting class, you know, um, uh, in the top ten, and then you're always surprised when they win. So I think that... Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, that would have a little something to do with it. So you're not supposed to beat teams that have higher ranked recruiting classes? Well, we certainly have before. We well, certainly have before. We didn't win this one. And I don't care to have a big discussion with you on it because I really don't care what you think. Like you know, and you run your mouth in your little column and stuff like uh, uh, some, some sanctimonious troll. And... Uh, 
where, you know, you've never been fair or even handed with us, so I really don't care what you think. Okay, go ahead, because you're going to write some nasty uh, stuff anyway, like you always do. And I don't know which coog way back when did something that offended you, and I really don't care about that either. But you can live your little meager, meager life in your little hole and write nasty things, and if that makes you feel even, you go right ahead. All right, here's my problem with it, Adam. Uh, John Blanchett, the spokesman review, uh, columnist, and, and he's been around a while, and I respect the guy. So I'm not attacking his character at all because that's not what I do, and I would never do that in our business because we all have our way of doing things. Right. Uh, but it felt like, um, and I've seen this before in other press conferences, that reporters will pile on a question and because they sense that they can probably get a good reaction out of it. So he comes right back and he says, so you're not supposed to beat teams that have higher-ranked recruiting classes. Now, you're asking for trouble when you look at Mike Leach. So you're not supposed to beat teams? like when, And that's how he said it. And he triggered Leach. So my thing is, you know, just because Leach came at you for a question like that, um, it was between the two of them, and he had sensed that Blanchett had written some stuff about that program in years past, and he always had an attitude toward the Cougars. Um, so before I go on, let's have this discussion. You tweeted out immediately that it felt like Leach was taking out the loss on the media and on this particular reporter. Give me your take on this thing. Yeah, a lot to chew on there. and, <laughs> and we've, we've had a few days to, to think about it and, and talk about it. First of all, it's Mike Leach, so it's not a total shock, anything he says, right? And, and um to me, uh, a first of all, his comment to, that led to the follow-up question about talking about recruiting classes is a total cop-out, total excuse. Uh, every program in the Pac-12 has beaten Chris Peterson uh, during his tenure at UW, except Wazoo and Oregon State. So a- again, and Mike Leach has a great track record at Wazoo already of knocking off the USC's, uh, the Stanford's, the Oregon's of the world who consistently have higher-ranked recruiting classes than they do. So. You know, you can't use it uh, on one hand to as motivation, the other hand to use it as an excuse either. So, and for that matter, the Huskies have never had a top 10 recruiting class either with, with Chris Peterson, but I understand his point that obviously they have higher ranked recruiting classes. But to me, it's a, that's a total cop-out comment. And it absolutely opens the door for a follow-up question. A, because this isn't the first time Leach has used that. He used that same exact thing two years ago when they were here at Husky Stadium and lost in virtually the exact same manner. So, Sure, I, especially uh, if you know what you're stepping into as a reporter, as a as a questioner, when you ask a follow up like that. But it was like, absolutely valid when Leach opens the door for something like that. That is honestly total cop out. Makes no sense. It was it had no validity in my mind. Yeah, but didn't you think it was his inflection of the question? Like you're not supposed to be like. No, like you've treating, got a point. You've you know, so point. and of course Leach is going to jump him. Sure. And um, I will say this. Theo Lawson, also the same paper, sure, sure. he put out a tweet almost immediately saying that Leach does beat those classes. He's, That's what I'm saying. He, in the yeah. la- and, and since 2015, the Cougs have beaten their 21 and 12 against programs that have higher ranked recruiting classes. So he has had success. And, and that's what he fired right back at Blanchett with oh, no, we've beaten those programs. So. So how can he use that as, a, as an excuse then? Because he should, not only is he not beating UW, he's not even competitive and he's not trying to make any adjustments either. So back to the point, I mean, I understand what you're saying and I have a little bit less issue of it because Blanchett is a columnist. And as a columnist, you're obviously, um, you know, you're, you have an opinion, you have takes. Um, I think John Blanchett has been one of the most respected columnists uh, in the state for a long time now. Uh, he's a terrific writer. Um, And again, I will state absolutely that I thought it was a fair follow-up question. Um, But he had to have had, like you said, he had to expect that Leach was going to fire a little bit. I thought Leach absolutely took it too far, took it too personally. I mean, it was a personal attack, and that's where he took it too far. But as a columnist, you have to be prepared for those things because when you're going to go out on a limb and you're going to call out a coach, you're going to call out a program consistently, and he has, and I I think most of it has been warranted, you have to expect some of that to bounce back as well too. Again, I think Leach Leach took it too far, and I think the larger point is he didn't want to talk about why they continue to get their butts kicked you know, in this Apple Cup, again, against Jimmy Lake's defense when – they haven't made any adjustments in six years now. Each they're doing the exact same thing. And Le- uh, Jimmy Lake's words and in the interview I had with him after the Apple Cup last year absolutely still ring true. Where 
they don't do anything different. And UW has shown that it doesn't matter what guys they have on defense, they're going to be able to slow it down because they know exactly what's coming. What it, I, I just, it goes back to what is Leach doing if he's not trying to make an adjustment? And that opens yourself up to whatever questions yeah. are out there. Because if you're not, to me, you're not even trying. And to me, he's, he's, he's given up before the game even starts because he's saying, well, you know, we can't beat these guys. And I, I absolutely, I have a lot of Cougar friends around here. I know you do too. But it's, they deserve some answers. Why, why are you even trying to be competitive? For him, it's a cop-out to be able to say, well, oh, they have better recruits. We're not going to beat them anyway. Like, terrible answer. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> All right, see, that's why I have you in here, right? man, because you, you help. <laughs> you're in the print world. And I will say I have a journalism degree, so I have a lot of respect, and I wrote for two newspapers before I got into television. So that's why I wanted you to come in and kind of help explain this, not only to me, but to other people who my, I know I'm in the minority when I see this. But I also have been doing the fifth quarter on Sunday night for 15 years, and I know that Coaches come out. Mike Holmgren came out. He needed to soften the uh, the edge a little bit before he came on what was a, a live program and start talking about a loss that sure. may have been tough. Sure. Jim Mora could not handle it. He came out, and we had to redo several segments for him. And that's not a knock on Jim. That's just his character. Right, right. You know, he's on his, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. Pete Carroll came in. I don't want anything to do with this show. We did one year with Pete, and he was done because he did not want – that kind of pressure to come out and have to talk on it and, and get yourself gathered that quickly, mm. especially on the road when you're trying to run to the bus and get on the plane and get out of town. Absolutely. So, um, so I'm looking as a broadcast perspective where a coach needs, Mike Leach especially, needs maybe more of a cooling down period. And I think at this moment on that big game, I know I'm rambling, but he may have needed more time to just take a sip and relax before he faced the media. Yeah, and that's all true. Absolutely. Almost kind of separate issues here. Um, I just, you know, can't do anything but condemn, you know, what I felt was like a personal attack. I absolutely think if he took it too far, he could certainly be frustrated by another loss and frustrated by a tough question. Um, but I, I absolutely thought he took it too far for yeah. someone who's, you know, uh, very well respected in this industry. Yeah, and, and I and I will say that about Blanchett. Like I said, this is not an attack on his character. It's just an attack on sometimes... Uh, because of the social media backlash that Leach got, it feels like sometimes journalists, and I, and I throw myself in that group because we're, you know, we're broadcast journalists, but um, I feel like journalists sometimes take that holier-than-thou attitude, and they're like, how dare you? You know, we are here to... And, and, and you know, I see that in my own building, sure. and it's just like, take a step back, man. You're not that important. Let's just do your job and do it right. And Blanchett, to his credit, after that game... He wrote a really nice game Good. story. I'm, I'm, he yep. didn't reference that that yep. exchange with Leach at I all. I thought it was total first class and yeah. professional. Yes. You know, a lot of people would have made it about themselves yes. and tried to drum up more attention because of it. Uh, he handled it like a pro. Yeah, I really believe that. And after I read his article, I'm like, man, it was, you know, uh, I, I respect good writers and, and he – he really nailed it, and he's really good at what he does. There's no question. And, of course, in social media, you got a bunch of keyboard warriors, and they're all out there going, yeah, you know, and it's like, so it became a bigger thing than maybe it would have been, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Sure. Um, but, but yeah. So. It's a good discussion. It's a good thing to talk about and air about. Again, I do feel like it's on maybe almost separate points. Of course, you have to expect some heat coming back if you're going to ask a tough question. Yeah. But there is, there is a line that I feel like Leach crossed. Well, right. you know, Jim Moore used to do that too. Um, we, he worked for was it the PI that, and, and now he's over at Seven Ten. And he was uh, he would always you know the go to guy was his column and mm. and um, Jim Moore yeah yeah yep. and I would always kind of just say I watched I would read the room when Jim was in it because I was, <laughs> I'm in a lot of those press conferences sure. and I'm not going to say oh I'm on all of them but I'm in enough of them to know that Jim used to sit there and he would fire that kind of question at the coach. Or whoever it was to try and get trigger reaction. Sure, sure, and it, yeah, some and people he was that's their style, right? And again, that that was the tone of his, you know, page two column as well for a long time. That's kind of the tone of him on on the radio as well. It's his personality, yeah. and so you can't tell half the time if he's tongue in cheek or being sarcastic or being insulting to yeah. you too. And that's that's kind of the, part of the fun in it. But well, you that, remember Richard yeah. Sherman? He, he tried to pull his badge. <laughs> a, a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other like, thing. You can't come in this building anymore. And Pete's like. You can't do that. <laughs> so he got on Richard Sherman for that. But again, um, that was a moment where, or maybe you know, I, I can't remember what what particular topic that was. But and I didn't feel like at that point Jim was an antagonist. But um, anyway, it's just a good discussion, it Adam. Is. And I know that 
that uh, you're protective of your world, and we should be protective of, of journalists and media in general. But I do think, in, in some, and I'm sure you've had that experience, man, where you read guys and, and you meet guys and they think that they're so damn important, and they're not that important. It's true. It's true. You know, it's, I try to keep perspective on that stuff, too. You know, I, I try to look at it like I'm just trying to do my job. And particularly, again, um, where Blanchett is a columnist, right? Again, he's going to go out on a limb. He's going to call out if somebody, if Leach or whatever, whoever, if he feels like he needs to be called out or obviously uh, give his take on that. My job more as a background as a beat writer, right? As a reporter, we try to be right down the middle, be objective. And it's not always going to be like that. You try to be analytical and um, creative and all that stuff too. But, um, you know, obviously trying to be fair uh, and accurate above everything else. Yeah. And, and uh, those are the overriding principles. And then everything else kind of trickles in after that, yeah. hopefully. Well, in a final word with Blanchett, I do respect him a lot. I just think this particular moment, Leach took too much crap for what he said, and that's all I'm saying. He took too much crap for reacting to that question. That's all I'm saying. I'm not condemning Blanchett at all because I think he's an outstanding writer and very well respected. So one more question about Leach. Do you think he is uh, on his way out out there? I just don't know where he would end up or what's what's open there for him. I think he's made it pretty clear to any and everyone who's asked that he would love to coach in the SEC. I just don't know who in the SEC wants him right now. Yeah. You think about Leach's career, you know, he spent a lot of time in Texas Tech, in Lubbock, Texas, and he spent uh, obviously a long tenure uh, in Pullman, Washington, too. And we're talking about maybe the two most remote outposts in college football where, you know, his uh, – his personality is, is I think, a, a little more accepted in those type places just because those are historically places that haven't had a ton of success. So, of course, he deserves a ton of credit for what he's done and the six success he's had. Um, but maybe in some other places with, uh, you know, a more whether diverse population or just bigger sure. population, bigger media market, those sorts of things, he, he might not get away with, again, what we just talked about, some of these outbursts and some of these random tangents that are cute and funny sometimes, but when you're trying to do a job or when you are uh, when you use that as an excuse for loss after loss or whatever the situation might be, uh, it might run thin in some other places. Yeah. So, again, not to say he can't have success. I know he's really curious and he's really confident that the air raid would work elsewhere in the SEC, and you see it the proliferation of the air raid in the NFL right now too. And so obviously he's one of the guys at the forefront of that movement. And, and uh, I, I'm absolutely curious to see what happens over the yeah. next month. We're get, absolutely going to see his name out there and more things. I, I just don't know what that is because, you know, as they said there in Arkansas, it's, you know, you, you kind of know what you're getting with Mike Leach at this point. And I just don't know if there are many ADs out there willing to kind of stick their neck out for, for that personality. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think you're right. He thrives in the Lubbock and the Pullman. Yeah. Because he is off the beaten path. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. And there's a know. lot of charm with that, too. But then again, you've got to be able to deal with the other side of it, which yeah. is, as we saw over the weekend, a lot of backlash for other for things away from football, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's funny, man. You and yeah. I are sitting here chatting, and we've never done a podcast together or anything. But, <laughs> but I'm looking at you and your body language, and I'm like, you know, I can tell that you enjoy what you do as far as beat writer and being oh, and, and facts and all that stuff but boy man I'm not a big take guy no but no. you know what here's yeah. here's the thing about that yeah. and i and, and it's a it's a it's a kind of a shout out to columnists out there cuz i learned long ago like i said in the first couple of newspapers i wrote for you know i was side by side with our columnists and yeah. it's an art man it, it is. really is yeah. it's a talent to be able to not only come up with a column maybe every these guys are expected to come up with columns a couple of times a week and even that's a lot, yeah. you know, that where, you, where you can write something with substance. So it's a, it's a big task, Absolutely. and it's an art. Absolutely, yeah. ton of respect for all those guys that can do it, for yeah. sure. Okay. All right, let's talk Seahawks. You you uh, you cover the Seahawks, and how are you liking that anyway, like that switch it's, from college? It's been to... fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I called triple for a long time. I was down at Oregon for about a decade, you know, six years with the Huskies. So this is all new territory. The nice thing is it's still football, the rhythm of it, right? You know, just moving from Saturday to Sunday. So the rhythm of it is still largely the same. It's just a little bit different, obviously, working with professional athletes. These guys are more mature and just they've got their own 
you know, sort of a lot of them corporations in mind yeah, right. too. And so, no, it's just fun to get to know those guys. And, and uh, they've been, a, I, I think, a lot more maybe personable or easier to get to know than maybe I thought coming in. I didn't have a ton of expectations, but it's been fun. It's been a nice little challenge just to kind of be in a new environment, new, see new faces and all that good stuff. And Bob Condota is the best at, at the Seattle Long Time beat writer at the Seattle Times. And so yeah. it's cool to work with him and for, my, for myself to be able to work on some different type stories that, that I have in the past. So, yeah, it's been a blast. You know, I uh, I have a lot of respect for Bob, uh, Greg Bell, and Tacoma. Like they're, they're those guys have been doing it for a while, and they're really good at what they do. Just like when you were doing all that stuff with the Huskies, like you're the go-to guy. Like and and as a guy in the broadcast, I'm always reading all of you guys that are covering these guys on a daily basis because mm-hmm. I can't be there every day. Right. And um, so I, I don't know why I threw that out there, but I just feel like <laughs> I should I be giving that. you guys some props. I appreciate that. Um, but I will say this before we dig too a little bit further into the Seahawks. Um, you do uh, right after the game, right? You have a three, like your quick three impressions. Sure, yeah. And yeah. I look, and I'm I'm walking out of the press box. It's already, and up, I'm always yeah. in my phone, and and it's up, yeah. and it's like, how f- hard is it for you to go and put out those three quick impressions right right away? That's a deadline that people aren't sure. used to meeting. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's not easy with this dang team, man. The, the, all the drama, and you think last night's a perfect example where they they go up 17 early in the fourth quarter, and if you see all of us in the press box, I'm sure uh, all two rows, uh, you know, full rows. It was a full press box last night. Probably virtually all of us had our head down and were typing at that point. So we're like, great, 17-point lead. You feel comfortable. You can write, particularly on a night game, we can write, start really writing our stories now. You write your lead and you really dig into it. And then you look up and all of a sudden it's a three-point game or four-point game again or whatever. You're like, ah, so you delete, 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 delete. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's the life of a, of a writer on deadline. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's always changing. You try to have, you know, so we do three impressions try to have one of them done at halftime and hopefully another one done, you know, early in the fourth quarter or something. Cause you got to figure one of them's going to stick. Right. The you're game. hoping one you're gonna come up with a generic enough one where, right. yeah, it's that or just, uh, it's, let me tell you, man, it's a juggle with this team because it's always something right. This yeah. fourth quarter is completely unpredictable. And yet it's totally predictable because the Seahawks just keep winning. They yeah. keep finding a way to pull these out. And it's been a lot of fun. Like I said, my first year just being out there every day. Obviously, I've followed the Seahawks, you know, virtually my whole life. But to see this team and the, and the way they're able to do that, and particularly in these primetime games, it's like I keep asking Bob, too. He's, he's been doing this a while as well. But how do they keep doing this? It's just, let's just This is who they are. This is who Russell Wilson is. Obviously, he's having a, a, the best year of his career. But something about Pete Carroll and the way the way the, that locker room ticks that – this is just how they operate. That's the norm for them to be able to operate at their best in the chaos. Yeah, the the what what Pete Carroll has brought to that team and that that uh, that franchise. I feel like he and John, of course, are a great combination. John Schneider, the GM. Um, but if, as long as they have John, Pete, and Russell Wilson, you can never count them out of right. anything. No, you really can't. And the thing about Russ too is watching him over his career from you know more or less afar it was just he was willing to take some chances on some things and obviously not a ton of turnovers in the past or interceptions but that's what's really impressed me you know obviously the fluky crazy one last night that you know the volleyball spiked for pick six but um he's taking the care of the ball so well and he, he doesn't take a ton of risks and yet the way he throws that deep ball it's been written and talked about obviously a ton too but uh just that combination of Finding that magic, making some crazy plays, but you know, limiting his mistakes because so much in the NFL is like the the team who makes the fewest mistakes is, is the team that's going to win. Yeah. It's not that hard of a formula. You run the ball, uh, you control the clock a little bit, and and uh, you know, you, you limit your mistakes. You're, you're going to have the success more often than not, and that, it seems really simple, not that sexy, but that's Russell Wilson's magic right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they are a fun team to watch. You look at their record, they're it's really wide open, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm actually heading down to Los Angeles a couple of days early, bringing all the kids, the whole crew, to go to oh, Disneyland cool. for a couple oh, of days. That's good, and so man. we got Sunday night game, and and I will be. It's going to be an electric environment. I mean, the Rams are desperate, right? They they have to have this. The Seahawks, but the King. Vikings put them back in the game. You know, they put right. them, it's true. Put them back in. Yep, yep. But uh, a lot on the line for the Seahawks too, obviously, particularly with Niners and and Saints playing as well. So everything is out there for the Seahawks right now and and I loved Russell's quote last night talking about we have everything we want we have everything we need and he's already looking down the road he, he quickly kind of pulled it back like obviously we have to prepare every day and only worry about the moment but these guys know that they're built right now the way they're going 
Um, you can call it luck. You can call it whatever you want. But the ball is bouncing their way, too, and they feel like this is a team of destiny. And it's, and it's hard. It's getting harder and harder not to fully buy into that idea, too. Yeah, yeah, man, I tell you, I watch this team, and I'm like, you know, Dalvin Cook goes down. Ben Roethlisberger goes right? down. The Eagles have nobody uh, <laughs> as, as far as on offense. Right. And it's like they keep running into these teams without their stars. Right. And I told uh, someone I was working with last night, I said, or it was a few nights ago, I said, you watch. In this Vikings game, they're going to lose a star in this game. <laughs> and the Seahawks are going to be able to uh, dodge a bullet and go on and win the game. And sure enough, they lose Dalvin Cook in the third quarter, one of the best running backs in the mm-hmm. NFL, and things change. And Kirk Cousins is garbage in prime time. <laughs> so, and see, I can say that. You yep. you don't have to, Adam. I said it. Well, it's so. Packed, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. It's not like a breaking oh, news. 0-8 oh, on Monday night, yeah. that guy. Yeah, Russ is 9-2. and two. I thought I was digging into some of the numbers yesterday. I'm like, dang, that pretty much tells you everything you need to know yeah. right there. Just on something about a prime time and, and Pete Carroll and – Russell Wilson, like you said, those guys together, you're always going to have a chance. Yeah. What? As we wrap it up, what uh, you look ahead to this, and because it is so wide open, you think this team is going to be a wild card team, or you think it's going to be a division champ? Yeah, I'm just. I, that's a tough, tough uh, sled for for the Niners against the Saints. We saw obviously here firsthand just how good the Saints are, even without Drew Brees. Still some question about a, you know, I think we're, Drew Brees is almost 41 now, and um, you know Alvin Kamara to me. Is, Probably the best back in the NFL. He's been banged up a little bit this year, but if they get him healthy down the stretch and into the playoffs, to me the Saints might be the most dangerous team in the NFC, but obviously the Seahawks are right there, Niners there as well. But, um, yeah, obviously, like I said, everything's out there for the Seahawks. I think they've got a great shot at that number one seed, particularly with the Niners having to come here to close out the regular season. Um, Why not? Like Russ basically was saying last night, why not dream big? This is the time. This is the team, and it's been a lot of fun. And just enjoy it here. Yeah. We're into December. This is these are fourth quarter, second half of the season, fourth quarter of the season. These are when the when these guys are at their best, and we're starting to see a team reach its potential. I think right now. Yeah, Russ loves to say, "Why not us?" And, and, right. and it's, it's really great for everybody to, to you know, why not me? You know, it's, I think it's a great uh, motto. So. Um, Anything else you want to add for the Seahawks? This like, has been fun, man. Yeah, yeah. no, this, is, this has been a fun season for me just to, like I said, be out there and get to know these guys a little bit coming from, you know, a college game where everything's a little more controlled and restricted. And, you know, these are young guys dealing with 18, 19, 20-year-old kids and now to kind of get more and dealing with adults every day. And just these guys, if they don't want to talk to you, they're not going to talk to you or, you know, they, they can handle themselves out there and in the Seahawks locker room. So it's been a lot of fun and it's been a, a, a nice learning adjustment for me and it, I've been able to do some cool stories. And so I uh, appreciate the, the Seattle Times for kind of giving me the opportunity to do that too. And, and uh, Yeah, because you guys, because it used to be just Bob out there, right? I mean, like you you coming on, it's like you guys are double teaming the Seahawks. Um, yeah, it's been fun. It's been cool. Yeah, we, we, we've always kind of had different people in and out and obviously you can never do enough Seahawks coverage. Right. Uh, you, you check our most read stories on SeattleTimes.com every day. It's pretty much always Seahawks or or Huskies there too, but um, yeah, it's been it's like I said, I, I it's really cool to kind of have this platform, this opportunity where they're letting me kind of dive into some different subjects and dive deeper into some some stories too. So I've, I've really enjoyed it, and and I feel like I'm I haven't hit my stride at all, still growing into it. But yeah, yeah I think as we you know like this team kind of get down the stretch here excited to do some bigger stories i'm going to jadavian Clowney's hometown next week before the the carolina game he grew up just outside charlotte and, oh, cool. and south carolina there and, you know we'll see that's a big question as we kind of head into the off season right what jadavian Clowney looks like a great fit with this team is he is he a fit long term and how much are the uh, are the Seahawks willing to invest in a guy like that so when will that story? Will you put that out like like Friday or Saturday that It'll week? It'll probably or? be actually not till later, maybe even early January. We'll see. Oh, okay. Pre- yeah, so as cut, our our plan is yeah as we head into the playoffs. But yeah, stuff like that where I haven't right. been able to do um, a much like that in the past. But be able to hopefully do a deeper dive, get to know him, his background, his hometown, Rock Hill, South Carolina, is basically the uh, the the heartbeat of of football in the South. They've produced a ton of football talent there. Really, uh, the list is really long and clowny. He's obviously at the top of that list, but uh, Stephon Gilmore, the star cornerback for New England's from there too, and they were teammates of South Carolina. And just a ton of talent there, and and uh, it's really interesting hotbed, and I'm I'm curious to see what that looks like yeah. uh, visiting there. Yeah, yeah, you've clearly done some research yeah. already, man. Yeah. Um, and one last question for you: When you look at this team and this roster, the Seahawks, um, and you talk about um, getting to know some of those guys, was there anyone out there that um, that surprised you that was 
you know, maybe more open than you thought or, or maybe more reserved than you thought or anybody, uh, a personality out there that, uh, that struck you? You know, just you. That's a loaded question. Right. No, yeah. Bobby Wagner has obviously been around forever. And I think everyone loves Bobby and it's hard not to, you yeah. know, obviously um, just kind of the, his tone and the way he stands up for everything. Obviously, you know, he's the, the veteran. He's the leader of that defense. But I have a lot of admiration for a guy who's who stands there in front of his locker after a game, win or lose, and is goes round after round of different media members kind of coming up. And it can be exhausting. And. Some players get dressed real quick and get the heck out of there, yeah. right? And I don't blame him for that either. But Bobby knows that everyone's coming. The rush is coming probably four or five, six different times after game. And he stands there 15 minutes and 20 minutes. And, and he'll answer all the questions. He doesn't shy away from them. And, I, you know, I really appreciate that. And I, I think that that's a little underrated kind of uh, in our profession. We Some people kind of expect that. Maybe going back to some of the, the post-game questions or just, you know, people in our, our shoes sort of feel entitled to certain things. I I don't, but I, I certainly do appreciate a guy like Bobby who's willing to stand there and look you in the eye, shake your hand, and what's your name again? And he's done that a couple of times with me, just tr- tr- trying to remember my oh, face cool. and my name, which, I you know, they don't have to do that. I right. don't expect that of everybody, but um, it goes a long way, and, and I, I certainly appreciate that, and I can see why he's garnered the respect and <laughs> and the paycheck he has, uh, certainly with with the Seahawks. Yeah, yeah. well, especially in I – mean, you couldn't have picked a better guy to talk about there because, yeah. I mean, people love him, and, and you just gave a ton of reasons why they do, not to mention if everything he does on the field but what he did at um the grocery store right the holidays another great and, example and, you know and he doesn't yeah and i like guys like that who don't want to trumpet it they don't put it out i'm gonna be here check me out or, or i'm gonna be giving out this you know it just got out there yep. that that's what he was doing organically because yes. kid, they're a bunch of teenagers who put it on social media and yeah. you know to me, that's, that's cool right yeah, I love that part of it, and uh, you're right. It is underrated when a player will stand by his locker. Even some of the Mariners pitchers who come off the mound have a crappy night, and they 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 just face the heat. You know, they're just like and 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 you respect that as a reporter for yeah. sure. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a ton of fun, and this has been fun too. I appreciate you having. Hey me. man, this listen, cool. this has been great. Yeah. I I'm sorry I, I kept you here so We're long. Good. We're good. <laughs> no, this has been fun. Yeah. We'll have to do it again when uh, we get another heated week, and there we can we talk go. about a lot there of different go. topics. But I appreciate it, Adam. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul.